Right, today we're going to go through the paper four theory paper for physics. It's the IGCSE paper from May June 2016. So code 0625 slash 41. And that's Cambridge International Examination. All right, let's begin. It's time! <laughs> Question number one. A bus travels at a constant speed. It stops for a short time and then travels at a higher constant speed. Using the axis in figure 1.1, draw a distance time graph for this bus journey. OK, so it tells us it's travelling at a constant speed. So for a distance time graph, we're going to get a straight line. So travels at a constant speed, then stops, and then goes at a higher constant speed. So what we should see, straight line. And then it stops. Then after a little while, it stops being stopped and starts moving at constant speed again. There we go, but faster. There we go. Part B. A lift, an elevator, starts from rest at the ground floor of a building. Uh, figure 1.2 is a speed time graph for the motion of the lift to the top floor of the building. Right. Use a graph to determine the distance from the ground floor to the top floor of the building. All right, key point here. The area under a speed time graph is the distance traveled. So we can take this and break it down into three areas. There we go. That's just it. It's 7.5. I'm just going to mark on this height here. Oh, it's three squares up. There we go. So that is 3.3 .3 meters per second. All right, so we have three areas. Let's just identify them. So we have areas one, areas two, and area three. Let's Area 1, that's area 1 plus area 2 plus area 3. So that's half times 7.5 seconds times 3.3 .3 meters per second, just because obviously it's a triangular shape. The next one is a rectangular shape. So 3.3 .3 times 12.5 seconds. And then the other triangular section at the end, 1 half times 5 seconds times 3.3 .3 meters per second. So that actually gives us 12.375 meters plus 8.25 meters plus 41.25 meters, which is 61.875 meters. However, all the information we're using there is two significant figures, so two significant figures for our answer, 62 meters. Don't forget to write down the units. Question 2. Figure 2.1 shows a dummy of mass 70 kilograms used in a crash test to investigate the safety of a new car. The car approaches a solid barrier at 20 meters per second. It crashes into the barrier and stops suddenly. Part, one, or part A1. Calculate the momentum of the dummy immediately before the crash. All right, nice easy question. Momentum equals mass times velocity. So that's just 70 kilograms multiplied by 20 meters per second. Which gives me a value of 1400 kilograms meters second and negative one. Two, determine the impulse that must be applied to the dummy to bring it to rest. All right, well, impulse is just the average force multiplied by the time that the force acts for. And the impulse is equal to the change in momentum. If we want the momentum, in this case, to go to zero, then we have to change the momentum by 1400 kilograms meters per second, negative one exactly the same number. And that's because the impulse equals a change in momentum. Momentum equals mass times velocity. The final velocity is zero meters per second. So we want to get rid of all of it. So the impulse must be equal to the same value as the initial momentum. B. In the crash test, 
passenger compartment comes to rest in 0.2 seconds. Calculate the deceleration of the passenger compartment. Right, so we know the initial velocity, the final velocity, and the time that the collision takes. So, acceleration is just change in velocity divided by the time it takes. That's interesting. So what we'll get is our final velocity minus our initial velocity divided by the time, which will give us a value of 100 meters per second squared. Negative. Okay, but this is deceleration we're being asked for, not acceleration. So the deceleration here is a positive value because it's a crash test, the item is slowing down. C. The seatbelt and airbag bring the dummy to rest so that it does not hit the windscreen. The dummy has an average deceleration of 80 meters per second squared. Calculate the average resultant force applied to the dummy of mass 70 kilograms. All right. Well, we know the acceleration here. We know the mass here. We are being asked to calculate the force. Well, force is just mass times acceleration. So that's 70 kilograms multiplied by 80 meters per second squared. Which gives us a value of 5,600 newtons. So we put that in as our final answer. And of course, remember the unit. Part D. The deceleration of the dummy is less than the deceleration of the passenger compartment. Explain why this is of benefit for the safety of a passenger. All right. Well, we're being asked why, if you like, here we go, I'll do a quick explanation of this. We've got force equals mass times acceleration. So we've got a smaller value for the deceleration. That means that the value that we have, the acceleration being undergone, is smaller. The mass doesn't change, but that means that the force is also smaller. Bigger acceleration, bigger force, smaller acceleration, smaller force. Okay. So what effect does that have? Well, as the deceleration decreases, the force decreases. So that means there's less force on the passenger. And that means there's less chance of injury for the passenger. Question three, figure 3.1 shows an oil tank that has a rectangular base of dimensions 2.4 by 1.5 meters. The tank is filled with oil of density 850 kilograms per meter cubed to a depth of 1.5 meters. A1, calculate the pressure exerted by the oil on the base of the tank. Okay, so what we're looking at here is pressure in a liquid. And pressure equals density times gravity times height. Which is just 850 kilograms per meter, per meter cubed multiplied by 10 meters per second squared multiplied by 1.5 meters. And of course, as always, the value for gravity can be found on the very front page of the exam. And that gives us a value of 12,750 pascals. But, although it's given us a value of 12,750 pascals, everything we've used has got two significant figures. So, our answer should also have two significant figures, and that's 13,000 pascals, or 13 kilopascals. Two. The force, calculate the force exerted by the oil on the base of the tank. All right, well, pressure is force over area, if we can do with pressure in a solid or a solid base, which means that force equals pressure times area, which is gonna give us 12,750 pascals multiplied by 2.4 meters multiplied by 1.5 meters. which will give us a value of 45,936.
and the force, of course, is in newtons. But as everything it comes from is in two significant figures, let's use two significant figures, and that gives us 46,000 newtons, or 46 kilonewtons. So remember the units. B. The force calculated in A2 is the weight of the oil. So calculate the mass of the oil in the tank. All right, well, our equation relating weight and mass is weight equals mass times gravity. We want to calculate the mass. That's just going to be the weight divided by gravity. And of course, the value for gravity comes from the front page. It is 10 meters per second squared. So that's 46 kilonewtons divided by 10 meters per second squared, which will give us an answer of 4,600 kilograms. There we go. Part C. When he is checking the level of oil in the tank, a man drops a brass key into the oil and it sinks to the bottom. State what this shows about the density of brass. Well, if it sinks, then a density of brass is greater than a density of oil. And two, explain how attaching the key to a piece of wood could prevent the key from sinking. Well, if the combined density of the brass and the wood is smaller than the density of oil, it will fall. There we go, if the density of the brass and the wood combined is less than the density of the oil, it will float. Question four, explain in terms of molecules why it's possible to compress a, a gas, but not a liquid. All right, well, in a gas, mostly there's empty space in between the molecules, whereas in a liquid, they're already very close together or touching. So with a gas, there's a lot more space for to jam the molecules into, if you like. Right, let's look at B then. Two containers made of insulating material contain the same volume of water at room temperature. The containers do not have lids. The volume of liquid in each container gradually decreases. Okay, so this is evaporating. After a certain time, the temperature of the water has decreased to below room temperature. Explain in terms of molecules why the temperature has decreased. All right, so this is all about how evaporation works. The molecules in a liquid will have a range of speeds, a range of kinetic energies, and some molecules will have a lot more kinetic energy than the average. If those molecules are close to the surface of the liquid, they can escape, and if they escape, they take all that energy with them, and the average kinetic energy that's left decreases, and the temperature is proportional to the average kinetic energy of the molecules. So some molecules at the surface of the liquid have more than average amount of kinetic energy and can escape the liquid. As they escape, the average kinetic energy of the remaining molecules decreases and the temperature decreases. Right, one of the containers is wide and shallow, the other container is narrow and deep. Predict which container has the greater rate of cooling. All right, what's going to be the wide and shallow container? The reason being because it's wide and shallow, it's going to have to have a much larger surface area and evaporation can only happen at the surface of the liquid. Okay, so it's a wide container, it's, it's a larger, uh, it has a greater area and evaporation only happens at the surface of the liquid. So it will have a larger rate of evaporation. There we go. 5a. State what happens to the molecules of a gas in a sealed container when the temperature of the gas is increased. Well, they move around more rapidly. So the speed of the molecules increases. B. A quantity of gas is contained in a sealed container of fixed volume. The temperature of the gas is increased. State, in terms of the molecules, two, reason why, two reasons why the pressure of the gas increases. OK, well, if they're moving around faster, there's going to be more collisions with the walls of the container. It's your first reason. And those collisions are going to be harder. There's going to be a greater change of momentum due to the collisions with the walls of the container. So more collisions with the walls of the container, harder collisions or greater change of momentum due to collisions with the walls of the container. That's two reasons why the pressure of the gas increases in the sealed container as the temperature goes up. C. A helium-filled weather balloon is held at ground level. The volume of the balloon is 4,800 cubic metres. The pressure of the helium is 98 kilopascals. 
The balloon is released and rises to a height with a volume of the balloon of 7,200 meters cubed. Calculate the new pressure of the helium. Assume that the temperature stays constant. All right, so for that, we're going to need our little equation. P1 V1 equals P2 V2. We want to find the final pressure, P2, and that's going to be P1 V1 divided by V2, which we can just put the information we already have into. So that's pressure 1, which is 98 kilopascals, multiplied by 4,800 meters cubed. And that's all divided by 7,200 meters cubed. And that will give us a value of 65333 pascals. However, as everything's in two significant figures, that becomes 65 kilopascals. Two, suggest why it may be necessary to release helium from the balloon as it rises even higher. Well, the reason for that is the volume's increasing, the balloon's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And we know from being on the surface of the Earth, you keep blowing up a balloon, it's going to pop. So really, it's to stop the balloon from popping. Six, two students are measuring the speed of sound. The students are provided with a starting pistol, a stopwatch, and a long measuring tape. The starting pistol, when fired, produces a loud sound, a loud sound and a puff of smoke at the same instant. Describe how the students use the apparatus and how they calculate the speed. You may draw a diagram. So let's draw our two students. First one is going to have a starting pistol, and the other one, here we go, is going to be holding a stopwatch. It's an enormous stopwatch, and I don't know how they're going to carry it, but let's assume they'll be fine. And they are separated by some distance d. We've measured. You'd want to make it a big distance. All right. So let's just run through explaining what happens. First of all, the person with the uh, little starting pistol will fire it. At the moment, the person on the right here sees the smoke from the gun. They will hit the stopwatch, start it timing. The moment they hear the sound, they will stop the stopwatch, and then we just calculate the speed of sound by doing uh, speed equals distance over time. So let's just explain that. So we measure a large distance between the students. One student fires the gun, and the moment the other student sees the smoke, they start the stopwatch. The second student stops the stopwatch when they hear the bang from the gun. And the speed of sound is then calculated using the equation speed equals distance over time. And there we go. B. A device at the bottom of the sea emits a sound wave of frequency 200 hertz. 1. The speed of sound in, in seawater is 1500 meters per second. Calculate the wavelength of the sound in seawater. All right. So what we need is our equation for a linking frequency, speed, and wavelength. And of course that is C equals F lambda. We want to find the wavelength, so wavelength is just C divided by F. So that's speed of 1500 meters per second divided by 200 hertz. Which gives us a value of 7.5 meters. Two, the sound wave passes from seawater into air. So, okay, it says travelling at uh, 1500 meters per second, it's going to slow right down to about 340 meters per second. State what happens, if anything, to the frequency of the sound and the speed of the sound. Well, frequency remains the same. Frequency doesn't change as it moves about. So, it remains the same. So it remains the same. The speed of sound, it slows down. There we go. And that's obviously because um, sound moves much faster in a liquid than in air. It moves much faster in a solid than it does in a liquid. 7a. 1. A ray of light passes through a length of curved, uh, curved optical fibre. Draw a diagram showing the fibre in the path of the ray of light. OK. Step number one, draw fibre. See if we can do this right. There we go. Fibre, 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 fibre. 
chanting five as you do it means you're more likely to get half decent picture. Five or 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 five. Alright, so we've got light coming in. Coming in like so. And then it bounces off the edge here, there, there, and there. There we are. So this is a ray of light. A light ray and this is a fiber. Okay. Describe one use of optical fibers in medicine. You may draw a diagram. Hmm. I think optical fibers are really handy because one of the main things they do, let's draw a terrible diagram here. Here we go, it's a person's head, nose, mouth. There we go. Why is their mouth open like that? Because they have an optical fiber going down and looking into the stomach. Optical fiber coming down here and going and looking into the stomach. Now just going to join all that together. It's not the world's best picture, it doesn't have to be. So one of the key things that you can do there, you can insert uh, fiber optics into the body. So you can physically insert them to look at internal organs, in this case the stomach. And light can travel along the path of the optic fiber into and out of the body. There we go. B, draw a straight line from each wave on the left to the most appropriate speed. Okay, light in air. Well, that's the speed of light normally, three times 10 to the eight. There we are. Close to the base just here. So let's draw a line down to there. The microwaves in a vacuum, exactly the same. And sound in steel, that we're going to be looking around about five kilometers a second. And there we go, we get six kilometers a second there. That's perfect. There we are. C, the refractive index of a block of glass is 1.5. Use your value from th for the speed of light from B to calculate the speed of light in this block. Okay. So new speed of light equals the speed of light divided by the refractive index. And what that gives us, of course, is 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second divided by 1.5, which gives us a speed of 2 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. I'm just going to put 2.0, two significant figures there. Let's look at the next question. Right. 8a. Two straight vertical wires, X and Y, pass through holes in a horizontal card. We're viewing the card here from above. There is a current in each wire in a downwards direction, so it's going into the page. The magnetic field at Y due to the current X, magnetic field at Y due to the current in X, produces a force in Y. Place a tick in each blank column of the table to indicate the direction of this magnetic field and the direction of the force. Okay, so... Let's just look at this. Uh, the magnetic field around X is circular. It's going in this direction. We'll do that with the right hand rule there. Okay, so it's going to get further out. And of course, we just get to this point where it's all, it goes all the way over to Y. Let's <laughs> stretch it a bit because I'm not going to keep drawing circle lines. There we go. That's it. And it's going to point downwards there. Okay, so let's see what we're looking at. That's the magnetic field from X, and we can see how that's going to be affecting the region at Y. So magnetic field at Y, that's towards the bottom of the page, and the force on Y, slightly more interesting here. So let's have a little bit of a look at the force acting on Y. There we go, two wires, where the current is both going into the page. Okay, so let's just draw the magnetic field. We'll draw the first couple of lines. Magnetic field coming around like that, of course it's going around in that direction. Got another one coming around here, slightly further out, going around in that direction, same direction. They should be equidistant, I'm just drawing them all by hand. Much the same as you would do in an exam if you were busy drawing little circles. 
course that's why it's quite helpful to have a set of compasses okay now for the first two magnetic field lines if you like coming out if i was to draw another magnetic field line something interesting happens you can see the magnetic field i'm just going to draw a bunch of arrows following it around so you can see what's happening on this side it's pushing down there we go and pushing up on this side now if i was to draw another magnetic field line coming around here see it comes over it's coming in this direction starts coming down but what happens it gets lifted up and pulled around because of the direction of that magnetic field line and again starts to close in here it's lifted up and pulled around because of that magnetic field line and what that means of course is that because it's being pulled around it's being stretched across like an elastic band if you like it's being stretched across and because you've got this sort of equivalent of this elastic band there's a force pushing these two wires together so here of course on this side we have x here on this side we have y so there's a force acting on y pushing it to the left towards the other wire and you find that regardless if the wires have the current going in the same direction and are close to each other in a running parallel will be a force pushing them together so there's a force acting on y going to the left there we are let's move on to the next part of the question state and explain whether there is also a force on x and the answer is yes there is a force on the wire x due to the field the magnetic field from the current in wire y same as it was in wire y because of x there we are. Part B. Figure eight point two shows a DC supply connected to the input of a transformer. When switch S is first closed, the needle of the galvanometer deflects briefly, then returns to zero. Explain why the brief deflection occurs. Hmm. Okay, so let's use our approach for this. Something happens which has an effect, which means therefore. So something happens. There's a brief changing magnetic field around a primary coil as the switch closes, which has an effect. Well, the changing magnetic field cuts through the secondary coil because it's being transferred by the iron core of the transformer. So something happens which has an effect, which means, well, this induces a voltage or current in the secondary coil. In this case, voltage and current. Therefore, well, once the magnetic field stops changing, no more current is induced in the secondary coil. Question 9. Figure 9.1 shows a 12 volt battery connected in a circuit containing resistors A, B, C and D. Each resistor has a resistance of 6 ohms. Part A. Calculate the combined resistance of resistors A and B. Well, they're in series. So, RT equals R1 plus R2 which is then just 6 ohms plus 6 ohms, which is 12 ohms. There we go. Now resistors A, B and C. This is just the equivalent, if you like, of having 12 ohms up here and 6 ohms down here now. And that is resistors in parallel. 1 over RT equals 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2. And that will give me 1 over 12 plus 1 over 6 ohms and that is then just 3 over 12. Now that's 1 over RT so RT is then 12 divided by 3 which is 4 ohms. There we go. And resistors A, B, C and D. All right so we're just really back to having something in series again. It's a 4 and a 6 there and that's just RT is R1 plus R2 which is then 4 ohms plus 6 ohms which is of course 10 ohms and there we go there's our answer B 1 calculate the current in the battery all right so we've got to find current, we know the resistance, we know the voltage was 12 volts, we know V equals IR. We want to find I, so I will then equal V over R. 
which is just 12 volts divided by 10 ohms is 1.2 amps. The energy transferred from the battery to the circuit in 50 seconds. Well, power is current times voltage. Work done is current time is power times time, which is current times voltage times time. So that's just 1.2 amps times 12 volts times the time of 50 seconds. Which gives 720 joules. There we are. 10. Figure 10.1 shows the symbol for a circuit component. Name this component. That is a light emitting diode. It's got a symbol for a diode with light coming out of it. In the space below, draw the symbol for a knot gate. Symbol for a knot gate is just a triangle. A little circle at the end, with a sharp pointy end. There we are. That is a symbol for a knot gate. B, figure 10.2 shows a digital circuit. Complete the truth table for this circuit. Hmm, long and complex. Let's make it easier. Let's examine what we have. All right, this bit up here is an AND gate. And an AND gate is one if both inputs, A and B, are one. Both of them. Not either of them, just only both. So let's look at output C. That means output C is one if A and B are both one. So what that means, here we go, input A is 1, input B is 1, input A is 1, input B is 1, 1, 1, and everything else is a 0. 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. Perfect. All right, now we've got output C and input D. So E here is an OR gate. And that equals 1 if, in this case, C or D or both are one. Okay, so it's only zero when both of them are zero. So let's look at where both of them are zero. There, 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 and all the rest of them will be ones. Problem solved. Let's check out our next section. C suggests a modification to the circuit in figure 10.2 to produce the output Z in the truth table below. It may help you to compare this truth table with the truth table in B. All right, so we get input A, input B, input D. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to write C in here. Why? Because it will make my life easier. There we go. So write C and I'll put down the numbers so I know what's happening. C only had two ones at the bottom and all the rest of them was zero. Zero, zero, zero. 0, 0, 0. OK, so let's look. They want this output. That's what they're saying. We want output Z. So we want it to be 1 if C and D are 1. Ah, well, pretty easy then, isn't it? All we have to do is come back up here and replace that with an AND gate. And that will give us the output that we need. So our answer here is just replace the OR gate with an AND gate. Question 11. Bismuth 214 is radioactive. It has a half-life of 20 minutes. The nuclide notation for bismuth 214 is 83214. State the composition of the nucleus of bismuth 214. All right, well, straight away, I know it's got 83 protons. And I know the number of neutrons is then going to be given by 214 minus 83 neutrons. So 83 protons and 131 neutrons. There we are. B, bismuth-214 decays by beta decay to an isotope of polonium PO. Complete the equation for the decay of bismuth-214. All right, well, straight away, the charge on it 
is negative 1. And with charge is conserved, so charge on the left has to equal the charge on the right. I've got 83 on the left, and that has to be the same as minus 1 plus something. Well, the only thing I can add minus 1 to to get 83 is 84. 84 minus 1 is 83. Now, we also have no mass for our beta particle. There's no protons, no neutrons, it's much smaller than that. So, the mass as we write it down is zero. What does that mean for our polonium? Well, 214 has to be some number plus zero. Well, 214, I'm guessing. 214, and 84 is our answer. C, the count rate from a sample of bismuth 214 is 360 counts per second. Predict the count rate from the sample after 60 minutes. Now, if we go up here, here we go. If we go up here, here we go. Half-life of 20 minutes. So 60 minutes. The question is how many half-lives is this? Well, 60 divided by 20 equals three half-lives. And what does that mean? We start off with 360 counts per second. That's one half-life. That's two half-lives. That's three half-lives. And that will give us a value of 45. So the count rate is 45. And don't forget the appropriate unit. 45 counts per second. D. State two of the social, economic or environmental issues involved in the storage of radioactive materials with very long half-lives. Well, one, they can leak into the water supply. That's a problem. That's problem number one. And two, well, you've always going to have an increased danger of cancer when you're dealing with radioactive isotopes. And that's one of the reasons why you have to be very careful with it. All right, there we go. That's that all finished then. I hope you enjoyed that. If you did, please feel free to like and subscribe. And you know what? Have a great day.